Hello and welcome to India's World. Just when they thought they had broken the gridlock on drafting a new constitution, Nepal's political parties have been thrown into a tizzy because of a Supreme Court order. The parties had decided that Nepal would be a federation of eight provinces to be demarcated by a federal commission. This took the most controversial subject out of the drafting process as the parties had been bickering over federalism since 2008. They also decided that Nepal would be a parliamentary democracy with an executive prime minister, that there would be two houses of parliament, eight provincial assemblies and an independent supreme court. There would also be a constitutional court which would last for 10 years. In effect then, most of the contentious issues had been sorted out by the big political parties through dialogue but outside the constituent assembly. However, in response to a petition, Nepal's Supreme Court last Friday issued an interim order staying all this. It ruled that the issues of state restructuring, that is delimitation of federal states, number of federal states and their names, should be decided by the constituent assembly and by not anybody outside it. To discuss the road ahead for drafting a constitution in Nepal in view of the Supreme Court judgment, we have with us a very distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Ambassador Jayant Prasad, he was India's ambassador to Nepal. Besides Nepal, he's also been India's ambassador to Algeria and Afghanistan, as well as permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. We have another ambassador from Nepal, uh, Ambassador Rakesh Sood. He was India's ambassador to Afghanistan and Nepal and permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. And Ambassador Shivshankar Mukherjee, he was also India's ambassador to Nepal, Egypt and High Commissioner to Nigeria and the UK. So we have three distinguished Indian ambassadors to Nepal who know Nepal like nobody else. So I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Uh, Jayant, let me begin by asking you a basic question. What was the significance of the agreement signed by the four big political parties of Nepal to speed up the constitution writing process? <coughs> how, how did you view it before the Supreme Court judgment? Well, most people were taken uh, by surprise and the decision to have an agreement to have a framework for a constitution and to go forward it, with it so quickly after the devastation that Nepal faced on 25th of April was uh, welcomed in the context of the predicament of Nepal today. They wanted the constitution question to be settled as soon as possible and that, that, is, that sentiment is what enabled the four political parties to come together and in their mind settle issues in a quick, uh, fast-track manner. So that was the significance. Okay. Um, Rakesh, do you think that Nepal Supreme Court has now put a break on this process of uh, fast-tracking the constitution drafting process? It has put a break, certainly. But I think there are two factors that were behind this uh, coming together. One was that after the earthquake, the Nepal government was seen to be somewhat at sixes and sevens in not being able to discharge its responsibility. You had a number of uh, foreign teams working in Nepal, including from India, of course. That was one. And the second was that this brought a certain amount of discredit to the political leadership that over the last seven years, they had been unable to come to an agreement on some of the contentious issues. So what they did was that in view of the international conference which is coming up, the international donor conference on 25th of June, they decided to take things in hand and come up with this agreement. But certainly the Supreme Court stay, whether it stays or does not, we don't know yet, but it has certainly put a break. Okay. Uh, Shiv, uh, the agreement that the various political parties had reached was only a political agreement. And it would, in any case, the various provisions would have to be ratified uh, or voted on by the Constituent right, Assembly in any case. So, uh, the Supreme Court could have said, for example, that, look, ratify it uh, in the Constituent Assembly. Give, give advice rather than stay the whole process. Well, uh, you know, this question of a stay order, yeah. I'm afraid, uh, if not the whole of South Asia, certainly in Nepal and in India, uh, the stay order endemic disease is well entrenched. I mean, you can get a stay order on anything. And uh, it is followed. It is law. Uh, I don't think it, it, is, it was... I, I, th I think the court would have overstepped its bounds if it had started advising the Constituent Assembly in how to go about this and that. To give the court its due, if it interpreted the interim constitution, which says that the delimitation uh, and so on should be done by the Constituent Assembly and not by a 
agreement between major political parties outside, although that may be the practical way of going ahead, I think, the, to be fair to the court, let's, let's give them their due in interpreting the interim constitution, which is, a, which is the existing constitution. So, the break, it, there is a break on this, uh, but I think there will be a huge sigh of relief in Nepal at this kind of agreement between the four political parties because they will have the numbers to, to push this through in the constituent assembly. And after seven years of wrangling and, and uh, you know, not being able to frame a constitution since the first constituent assembly election in 2008, uh, one would, <coughs> should be optimistic that, you know, we, we've got a constitution in Nepal coming around sooner rather than later. Okay. Uh, Jayant, if that is the case, that the Supreme Court was uh, well within its right, I'm sure it was, uh, in giving this interim order, why is it that on June 12th, the Supreme Court rejected this rate petition first, saying that, look, it's a political issue, don't bring it to us. And then four days later, on June 16th, another judge admits it and then uh, 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 passes an uh, uh, interim order in a few days' time. Well, there was, uh, uh, judiciary doesn't uh, operate in a vacuum. There was a growing body of opinion within Nepal, including within their political structures, which uh, said that what was done was not correct. <coughs> and one of the things that was very unusual in the present instance, it, the interim <coughs> constitution's provisions have not been respected in the past, but the manner in which that has been done is a very judicially sound one. For example, in 2008, the constituent assembly was given a tenure of two years. This was successively extended because of its inability to frame a constitution within the time frame. Each time that they wanted to extend the constitutional validity of the duration of the CA, they passed a constitutional amendment, amending the interim constitution. Had this interim <coughs> constitution's article 138 been amended, it clearly specifies that the names, numbers and boundaries of the new states will be determined by the Constituent Assembly. All that had to be done was a constitu constitutional amendment to have been passed, setting aside this article or suspending Why was it, it not passed? Because they wanted to ram through this decision quickly. That's why it was not passed. Alright, we'll, we'll discuss this further, but we need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again in a bit. Don't go away, stay with us. Welcome back. We're discussing the constitution drafting process in Nepal and how it's been impacted by a stay order by the Nepalese Supreme Court on the settlement reached between the various political parties. Uh, uh, Rakesh, now we are discussing Article 138 of the Interim Constitution and it says, and I quote, the final decision relating to the structure of the state and federal system shall be made by the Constituent Assembly, unquote. Now that's fair enough and uh, Jayant also pointed that out. But why can't the constitu cons constitutional gridlock be broken outside uh, through political discussion and then brought to uh, the, the Constituent Assembly? Why does it have to be done first in the Constituent Assembly? If consensus is generated outside the Constituent Assembly, they can all, obviously they'll have to come back to the Constituent Assembly later on for wh whether it is setting up the Federal Commission or uh, deciding on numbers of uh, uh, provinces. True, Bharat, you're right. But what has also happened is that we've seen a certain uh, fracturing of politics and particularly within the Maoist party, which has fractured more than once and certainly within the Madhesis, which, of which there are now more than a dozen factions. And here, a number of Maoist parties, which were earlier under one leadership, uh, have criticized this agreement. It is basically Prachand and Baburam Bhattarai, that group which has supported it. And among the Madesis, it is only Vijay Gachedar who has supported it. The other Madesi leaders have been critical of it. And uh, therefore, perhaps, while the four parties that have gone ahead with it, I think they control something like about 485 or 490 seats out of 601. So in that sense, they do have a two-thirds majority. But nonetheless, um, they felt that it was politically easier to come up with an agreement first rather than take it first to the CA where in any case uh, there could be disruption activity. And let's not forget, as I mentioned earlier, we have this major international donor conference coming up on 25th of June. And um, it was imperative that the government present at least a unified look 
in terms of the international donor community so as to get um, a good commitment for funding for reconstruction. Okay. Uh, Shiv, the main objection of the Nepalese Supreme Court seems to have been the setting up of the Federal Commission for uh, delineation and demarcation of provinces. Um, and they quite rightly said it's the job of the Constituent Assembly. So was the uh, objection of the Supreme Court limited only to this? Because they said that the Constituent Assembly's life ends when its term ends. And therefore, everything that it needs to do has to be done within that period. So you can't have, uh, you can't have something inheriting constitutional rights, the Federal Commission, for example. Probably, but I think the main thing is, I mean, to look at it from a practical point of view, the sticking point was the federalism question. Yeah. And uh, the rest, to my mind, is detail that can be sorted out politically and then put a rubber stamp on it by, by in the Constituent Assembly. I think, I agree with Rakesh, the two fundamental sort of motivations behind this uh, uh, leap into to overriding the, you know, the problems that have bedeviled the constitution making for seven years was A, during the earthquake, it is true, the government was not visible. I mean, uh, there was in fact a fear that the only thing among the people of Nepal who, you know, brought in democracy through the Andolan, that the only organized force, the only organized Nepali force that was seen uh, during those, those awful days was the Nepali army, nothing uh, from the civilian government. One was that to refurbish that image that we are a working government, we can do things and of course the donors no, but conference. But I was more on the constitutional question. Uh, the Supreme Court is saying that constitution writing stops and everything must be finished within that, must not leave any task uh, as an area. That, as that I said, practically if these four parties have agreed on uh, a certain thing, uh, they have the numbers in the Constituent Assembly to amend the Constitution. They don't have the consensus. They have the majority. And this Constitution is being written through consensus. You know, I have the interim Constitution itself will give you a guide on that. It almost broke down right up to the midnight hour. And then the, the, the Nepali genius of finding a compromise took over. They said there are too many people making objections. So we will include everybody's article into the interim Constitution, which is why you have this huge interim constitution of 175 articles, but it has worked. I am almost certain that uh, these, these very fine judicial, fine print kind of, uh, uh, you know, objections to the constitutional uh, fine legal process will be overcome if there is a consensus among these four major political parties. Okay. Jent, uh, uh, the Supreme Court is not only on fine legal points, you know, it's making broad sweeping uh, points also. For example, uh, I understand uh, what the Supreme Court is saying about federalism, but it goes on to say that issues of federalism, understood, inclusion and gender quality cannot be left in arrears. So how does inclusion and gender quality come into the political agreement that has been reached between the four political parties? So what is the court objecting to? No, federalism is intrinsically uh, linked to the question of inclusion because uh, the whole point of uh, the state's boundaries is linked to gerrymandering of the states in a way that the people who are supposed to benefit by getting democratic rights, the Janjatis, the Adivasis, the uh, Dalits and the Madhesis, they would uh, not get the democratic rights in the manner in which the states are being arranged now. And if you recall, in 2008, after the Constituent Assembly was first set up, there was a commission which was a commission of the Constituent Assembly. And after very detailed examination of issues, they come up, came up with an idea of 10 states, uh, sorry, 14 states. And these 14 states were seen as too profligate by the rest of the Nepali elite and population. And therefore, they said that we can't afford 14 states at this stage. So let's have the kind of commission that now is being conceived of uh, experts and these experts then were constituted by the CA and they come up, came up with the idea of 10 states. So this is going to be a problematic issue whether it is settled now or settled I, I, later. I, I agree but I'm really saying that the court is presumptuous in, in, in sort of prejudging uh, the, the, the commission which has not even been set up. I wouldn't say that because uh, there are a couple of points in the petition on which the court hasn't even okay. responded. And these points are important because they are again in the interim constitution. For instance, the fast tracking of this uh, procedure has meant that the one month period in which the people of Nepal are supposed to comment on the package, the feedback from the public, informed public, 
that has been short circuited and the second thing which is being short circuited is the idea that every article will be voted on or agreed by consensus when it comes up before the constituent assembly the present constitutional package is being presented as in its entirety as a package okay. and the ca is being asked to vote upon it in one lump okay not and not clause by not clause not clause by clause and this is another objection of okay. people who so so we'll, we'll wait for that judgment but we need to take a break again at right. this point we'll be back again in a bit stay with us welcome back we're discussing constitution drafting in nepal uh, rakesh how could the supreme court issue an order without hearing the political parties against whom the, the charges that they did this deal outside the constituent assembly or even hearing the government of nepal so, you know does it seem like a unilateral action and are we witnessing here uh, an activist supreme court interfering in the political processes and the constitution making processes i think that is a fair assumption my guess is practically speaking that we will see an appeal against this because this was a single judge bench uh we will perhaps see an appeal in which we will have a larger bench which will consider this question but practically speaking bharat if you look at the whole federalism issue even before the four main principal political parties announced their agreement on 8th of june i think before that in the discussions we had seen a reasonable degree of convergence as to the number of provinces and also as to their delineation the sticking points were essentially 5 out of 75 districts you know at the eastern end and at the western end of nepal and these were the sticking points so by and large the political process had reached a fairly advanced stage of consensus development these three or four districts which were left out where there was uh, where passions were high were the ones which needed to be cooled down so the federal commission which essentially has been given only 6 months to complete its task is not going to in my view reopen entirety of federalism packages but basically come up with ways and means of addressing concerns so that the final aspects of uh, delineation yeah. can be put into place but shift clearly there are groups in nepal and political parties in nepal which feel left out of this process they think that these bigger political parties are you know pushing their way through and here we were talking about a inclusive nepal and even in the at the political level uh, before writing the constitution they are not including us so you know a process of inclusion cannot begin by exclusion well you are absolutely right in the sense that if you look at the history of the evolution of this whole process over the last 7 years yeah. this is precisely the point on which uh, you know things have usually broken down uh, what rakesh referred to as this this whole business of how really to carve up nepal into acceptable you know delineated districts i mean the fight has been very at one level very simple the vertical versus the horizontal i mean the the ruling well, is also elite, about the uh, ethnic versus uh, mixed the, ethnic the pahari the the ruling pahari bahun chhetri elite which wanted a vertical kind of delineation so, so that they control they kept controlling their uh, where they had influence in the tarai and then after 2008 and the andolan the the resurgence of the aspirations of the madheshis and the janjatis and the dalits and so on who wanted uh, a, a completely different yeah. a, a horizontal kind of delineation the five districts is talking about exactly were the sticking points and which led to the the potentially future prime minister kharga prasad sharma oli saying that if these people don't want to uh, stay in nepal they can go to eastern up and bihar uh, 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 so let, we let, are let not at the end of the road because no we don't want to go too much into uh, <laughs> Nep nepalese okay. map making but uh, on the question of what motivated political parties to come to this settlement you know few people have said earthquake focused their mind and they wanted to uh, present a united face to the donor community but were they the only reasons I, uh, was there not political ambition of his name the gentleman who thought that he has to become the next uh, uh, prime minister because this is party's turn there were others who want to escape war crimes uh, trials and want access to power they are out of the government just now uh, bijay gachadar a joining come lately to madhesi politics wanting to accrue uh, more power to himself so what petty uh, political considerations not Uh, a motivating force now no, i talking. think there was a larger <laughs> political consideration not petty considerations mm -hmm. and the larger consideration was that this constitution making 
effort has gone on for far too long. Then why not take others also with you? And the democratic processes are getting undermined because people's faith in the electoral system itself is going away. And the question of taking other people along will come into play now. I think let's look at the Supreme Court judgment as a corrective. Let's look at it as a signal to the Constituent Assembly and to the major political parties that look, we are in sympathy with this idea that there should be a constitution, but please be more consultative. Please follow the procedures which follow the guidelines, follow the framework. After all, it was decided already and as Rakesh has said, the differences are very small. The differences are on Jhapa, Surang, uh, Morang and Sunsari on the eastern side and on the western side, Kanchanpur and Kailali. It is going to be settled and I agree with also your initial question was that uh, would it not be proper or would it be improper uh, for the Constituent Assembly to leave over certain technical issues to be decided later. In my reckoning, that's the only way to do exactly. it because there is no other solution. But they will have to do it through a consultative process which, of which the Nepali people and politicians are capable of. Okay. Rakesh, why is it then that uh, Nepalese commentators are saying that besides the earthquake, it's really these full, uh, four political parties uh, which wanted to divide the cake amongst themselves and that's why they, they reached the agreement. KP Oli, Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Baburam Bhattarai, Chairman of the new Reconstruction Commission, so people are saying, Prachanda and other party men wanting to get key portfolios in the government, Vijay Gachada trying to sort of project himself and solidify himself, consolidate himself as a Madhesi leader. Well, that is true. But then, Bharat, as I mentioned earlier, in 2008, in the elections, what we saw were two new political forces yeah. emerging. One was the Maoists and one were the Madhesis. Yeah. Now, both these forces have been incredibly fractured. And in the process of fracturing, it is the Prachand Baburam group, which has become the dominant group in the Maoists. And among the Madesis, it is basically Gachedar, who represents a large chunk of uh, the Madesi uh, strength in the Constituent Assembly. So naturally, they are the ones who are trying to carve up the spoils of office, as it were. And uh, the others who are outside it will have to be brought on board in some manner or the other. There are enough options in terms of whether it is cabinet positions, whether it is uh, commission chairmanships and so on. Okay. Or once the provinces come into being, there will be provincial leaders, provincial assemblies. Okay. So eventually, the situation will settle down. So there are a lot of people in Nepal who are now saying that after the Supreme Court order, the process of constitution making will become simpler and it will be hastened. Now, I can't see how. Do you see uh, it being hastened and simplified? I hope so. And I do think so because... Uh, a certain, you know, uh, earlier there were, there were no, instead of agreements, there were only reports for years and years and years of disagreements, of, of uh, nobody agreeing with anybody else, of, of uh, you know, uh, discordant notes everywhere. Nothing was really moving. I mean, everybody realized that federalism is a major question. It was discussed. But we are back bear. to square one, aren't we, in, in, in a sense? Uh, but no, I think the fact that the, the four major political parties, for whatever reason, for reasons of... Uh, political expediency or furthering their own interests or whatever, or for the greater good of the nation, take your pick. The fact that they have come to this kind of decision and that these are the four major political parties, I, I repeat, regardless of personal ambitions, political ambitions or whatever, have done this. And the Supreme Court has now intervened to, to, to put a break on it, saying such and such and such a, uh, things have not been done or not been taken care of is really, I think, uh, loosening the knots. Okay. Uh, I think it will focus okay. the minds of these All people right. that we have to come to a proper decision now. All right. Last word to you. Do you think the process of constitution making has been simplified now and hastened now by the court order? Or has it been stalled? I would say, uh, Bharat, this is a corrective. And I think uh, constitution making will go right back on the correct track and reach a conclusion quickly. Okay. I think uh, this is going to be helpful and not unhelpful. All right. On that happy note, uh, we've come to the end of this discussion. I'd like to thank you, Ambassador Shiv Shankar Mukherjee, Ambassador Rakesh Sooth, Ambassador Jain Prasad, for coming here and discussing this complicated subject with our viewers. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again as usual next week. Till then, goodbye and thanks for watching India's World.